So, hi. <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today uh, and to welcome you to the Department of Art Visiting Artist and Critique Lecture Series. My name is Rotem Tamir and I'm Assistant Professor in the Department of Art. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, Lex Brown. Lex Brown is a multimedia artist who uses poetry and science fiction to create an index for our psychological experiences as organic beings in a rapidly technologized world. Through humorous characters and expensive storyline, her work opened up a place for spiritual examination. Brown has performed and exhibited work at the New Museum, the High Line, the International Center of Photography, Recess, and the Kitchen, Red Cat Theater, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and the Munch Museum in Oslo, Norway. She was a 2021 recipient of the prestigious USA Fellowship. Consciousness, an anthology of her video and performance work, is available from Gender Film. Her sci-fi erotic novella, My Wet Hot Drone Summer, was first published by Badlands Unlimited. Brown was a 2020-2022 media fellow at Harvard University and currently teaches drawing in the program in visual art at Princeton. Brown's podcast, 1-800-POWERS, is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Her first solo museum exhibition, Carnelian, featuring new original music, will open at the MIT Lee Center in April. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lex Brown. It's a Zoom, so it's hard to clap I and know. hear that. <laughs> thank Here you so Anna. much, Rodam. <laughs> thank you so much, Rodam, and thank you to everybody at the university for inviting me to be here tonight. I'm really excited to do a very a brand new lecture about my work. There is new work in this lecture, and so I can't wait to share with you more about my practice from the perspective that's really important to me that. I don't always talk about uh, my work from. So as you know, the talk is called Behind the Scenes. And I wanted to speak about the what and the how and the why of being a multimedia artist. One of the questions I get the most when I talk to different groups of other artists or at schools is people ask me about why do I work in so many different media or how does it work? So I thought, why don't I just make the whole talk about that and peel back some of the curtains? So this is going to focus on why I work this way and then getting into how those things actually come into being and and also having a practical discussion. And for our q and A, I I'm really am open to, and I'm hoping that if anybody has like very practical questions about money, about budgets, about actual like writing tips or exercises, about resources, about residencies or theater groups, that we'll be able to talk about those things because those are all the parts of a practice that don't go up on the wall or in the gallery, but are really the majority of the work. So if you've gotten a chance to look at a bit of my work online, you might know that I work in many different ways. And these are pretty much all of them, but I'm sure there might be something that I left out here. And these are all sort of organized roughly where each of these things overlap. So increasingly I've started to internally, I think of myself as a, a writer because text and writing is at the heart of most of the ways that these different parts of my practice come together. And writing can be in the form of just very uh, 
text on a paper, whether that's a fiction story, like my book, my wet hot drummer, <laughs> my wet hot, <laughs> my wet hot drone summer. I've been listening to a lot of music lately. Wet hot drone summer, or the short story that I have that's coming out this March with the Night Night Foundation, which is also a science fiction story or sometimes sharing my thoughts in Instagram posts, also writing essays for different friends or different exhibitions. Then sometimes the writing takes a form in podcast. Um, my podcast 1-800-POWERS is a project I started last year as a place that I could, a little container that I could have to hold writing when I wasn't invited to write something or I just had these excess of thoughts that I wanted to share and also a place that I can have conversations with people. And that collaborative energy also works into the music that I write. Um, a lot of times I'm collaborating with other musicians, like on the project I'm working on now, Carnelian is intensively collaborative project and music and writing also makes its way into performance. Um, sometimes the writing in the performances is less like dialogue and it's more like poetry. And this book, Consciousness, is a book that I published with Gender Fail in 2019, which now seems like a million years ago, but really wasn't that long ago. And this is an anthology of 33 songs and poems that I had never put in printed and writing before, but they they've been part of my performance practice. So after college, I moved to LA and I started making these song cycles, these like conceptual songs, and then I perform them and kind of like talk in between the songs. And it was something in between like a song cycle, cabaret-esque, not really in cabaret venues, but something of like that kind of format, not exactly stand up, sometimes doing some clown stuff. So a lot of those songs and poems that had never been printed or shared anywhere are in this book that Genderfield published. And then text is often a big part of my work. So this giant hamburger sculpture says rage on the patty. And that's part of a series called Wave Sandwich. I've made several works that all have a hamburger in them. They're called Wave Sandwich. So this is also called Wave Sandwich. And it's uh, this drawing is just a depiction of something that I've experienced a lot in my neighborhood since moving away is waving to the neighbor, waving to a neighbor and that neighbor, usually a white neighbor, not waving back. But I thought it'd be funny if this neighbor was very grimly eating a hamburger. Um, so Texas also works its way into drawings and into paintings. And then I work in sculpture, usually in conjunction with performance. And video is something that I use as documentation and also as work itself. So I really think of myself as a, a writer who makes installations and music. I don't like to be contained into a box, but it's useful to think about, to have like one thing that's the kernel the work. So usually when I talk about my work, I focus on this part, all of all of these things. And what I don't really talk about is how it happens. And it happens through a lot of like white rectangle screens. <coughs> so on the left hand side, this is like things I use to organize my life. Most of my projects that end up being some big colorful or live event, they start off as a voice memo that I make to myself. I'm constantly leaving voice memos, like, you know, at four in the morning, if I wake up thinking of a song in my iPhone notes, um, notebook planner, all of these things that are pretty dry and, um, Oh, if I could point my camera the other way, you'd see how many calendars I have in my room, but I'm like literally looking at four calendars right now. And uh, also organizing everything under a company, which my company is Bitwaffle LLC. And all these forms of organization are something that I have come to gradually. It was something that I had to 
learn and develop as part of my practice. It's not anything that anybody ever told me about in grad school. Nobody ever, you know, I don't know, no, not a lot of artists that I've, I've, you know, seen talks by talk about that aspect of things, like just how much organization there is into building a sustainable practice. And I do feel like the question of sustainability is one that artists who work in time-based media and sculpture are having to ask themselves more so than um, artists who solely work in painting or drawing or two-dimensionally. And that just has to do with the market and sales. And, you know, when you're making the sculpture, you have to think about, is it going to be in a storage unit for a period of time? And I'm going to pay for the storage unit. So as I've uh, developed my practice more and more, I have become really interested in these questions of economy within my own practice. How can I do things more economically in the sense of how can I simplify certain things in order to then maximize other parts of my practice? So, you know, how could I like simplify a song in order to then share it in a bunch of different ways or how can I make something as a print instead of a drawing so that then it's more accessible to people and it can help support my performance practice. So these are sort of the organizational tools that I use. And then, and then, then things get moved into my iPad where I draw everything and sketch a lot of things and um, into my physical studio. But just as much as I work in my physical studio, I'm working on my iPad and I'm also working, I mostly use Logic to edit my music and I use Premiere to edit video and uh, play my piano at home. And I have a piano at the studio and as many keyboards as I can have around, I try to have. And then, and then the next column is how I'm sharing with people and communicating with people. So I, I was, show you all uh, later in the talk, my intense Google Drive that, that I have going on right now for this current project and emails. Yeah, I hate them. Um, when I was in in college, one of them, for my thesis show, I made a book called Emails in Your Inbox. I think my anxiety about emails began early. Uh, I'm definitely more of a voice note person. But yeah, all these different ways are that I communicate are really a part of how the work happens. So to talk about the why of why working in so many different media, um, I kind of want to start with where I grew up. So I grew up outside of DC in Northern Virginia, maybe about 40 minutes outside of Washington, DC. But we would often go into DC on weekends to go to museums or whenever we had friends or family in town visiting. We go into DC. My mom worked in DC for a long time. I think she's on this call. Hi, mom. Um, thanks for being here. And so this is a kind of architecture that imprinted early in my mind. And this is a picture of the National Mall. And there's a very clear geometry to the layout of the landscape. And you really get the sense of with so many government buildings, you, you just get the sense of like, okay, this building is government like this is where law sits in this building and that's something that's always fascinated me is just the meeting place of these physical structures or architecture and what design elements comprise them and how those meet with structures or power and how funny it is that they just seem like plopped there that's just endlessly interesting to me so yeah, this is a photo of me as a kid with my cousin, my aunt, my grandma. So we will always go here and just be around this architecture. And even today, I will take friends there to, to the museum because there's not that much to do in Northern Virginia. So probably the first reason why I'm a this is Northern Virginia is boring. <laughs> um, I was like always a very active kid, always an active imagination. So this is Great Falls where I grew up. It's named for this national park. I grew up around a lot of nature and trees and bendy roads and forest paths. So there was an element of, or there is an element of me that's super connected to nature, 
there's a lot of trees that are in my work. Um, this is a park that's nearby our house. And then, oh, I'll get to some photos later about what's in the midst of that. In the midst of that, it's like the most generic boxy box box stores ever. But um, so this is the some more childhood photos because I'm feeling nostalgic and just wanted to share these. Um, this is my mom and my dad and I in the foundation of our house as it was being built. And I find myself returning to this photograph a lot because on the one hand, it's like this image of a nuclear black family, which is, this image is not an image that I ever grew up with. So it's interesting for me to return to it because I didn't have this image, you know, as a photo was being taken. It's like, as a photo was being taken, I couldn't see it or even understand it really understand the social context of what it meant to be part of uh, this family that was, or is still, um, my parents are still together. And, you know, we all get along very well. But this image of, of a nuclear family that is Black and the social mobility that I think my family's been able to have is partially due to um, my dad working in corporate America and my mom works in foundations and health policy and worked in Washington for a long time. So I just, I find myself returning to this image because it's not really one that I see. And then it's also formally just a really beautiful image to me and to, we're inside this foundation but then at the same time like these homes that were being built in the 90s in northern Virginia were part of this tech boom northern Virginia is really um known for being a data center and and that is one of the things in addition to the education system that brought my family out there um but I'm interested in this this architecture this architecture that is really meaningful from the standpoint of a Black family establishing themselves in a way that would not have been possible in generations prior. And then at the same time, like the specificities and the economic specificities of like what was happening with technology and that part of the country that I grew up in and like building methods to make this kind of architecture, to make these kind of homes possible. And um, this is just me with some stuff because I've always like to tinker with stuff. Um, but yeah, this image also to me feels like the installation space. And this is me as a kid watching TV and TV and technology is just always a part of um, my world and early life. So to a certain extent, this multi multimedia verse, um, I think was just, has just been ingrained, um, but also because growing up in like a mostly white community, there, there was a sense of alienation that I was not really conscious to until much, much later, you know, maybe only like, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, did I really become aware that there was also this sense of alienation. And again, not from my family, but just within the community that we were in, which a lot of times didn't really feel like a community. It's an area that has a lot of single family homes. And um, so, so there's sort of this element of the idyllic, but also the dystopic. Um, and these are from the website McMansion Hell, if you've ever seen it. It's just really funny where this woman dissects these McMansions and all of their architectural idiosyncrasies and all of the ways in which they are just sort of have all these different architectural elements tacked on. And so in the same way that there's these sort of like tacked on windows and anachronistic like references to other points in history, there's just something about the, the space that I grew up in, whether it's these houses or, or Washington DC and like the national monument 
being this like uh, obelisk in the sky that I feel like that visual landscape has really informed my work and informed the way that I see see the world and understand how these kind of like wisps of history are are happening through design. Um, and so that is one of the ways in which I try to express certain power structures or certain political ideas is not just through the kind of like capital P political language that we kind of formally recognize in art, but also in these like weird cultural detritus, like what like the flotsam of just postmodern life. Um, I don't watch Real Housewives of Potomac, but I heard there was an episode where they're all in Potomac, Maryland, which is right across the Potomac River from Great Falls. And they're like the same place, but everybody was ragging on her for moving to Great Falls. And I just, you know, that also is kind of funny to me uh, and also sort of represents, I think, the mentality against which I always felt sort of rebellious is is very, it's an area, there's a lot of conformity. There's a good deal of like ethnic diversity and racial diversity, um, but it's very conformist and politically liberal, but relatively conservative in terms of like what people want in terms of like lifestyle. Like there was no youth culture. There was no, there was no zines. There was no nothing. So part of the impulse to be a multimedia artist is just like, ah, I need to get out of this box. I need to get out of this container. I need to get out of the freaking strip mall. I need to like, I need to, I want to experience life beyond um, the village square. This is a strip mall that's actually called the village square. Um, and this logic or weird, I don't know, this very weird logic of, of, calling it the village square, even though it's not a village. And like in most parts of suburban America, there's just strip malls and there's this, this like very sad and sort of thinly veiled um, desperation to create some sense of like culture or community or heritage. Um, and it's accomplished by like this line, like these lines and this roof design are what's meant to accomplish that sense of heritage. And that's what's meant to fill that that void that's created um, when you have these neighborhoods and areas that are really covering up and erasing all kinds of history, indigenous history, but also like different parts of American history. There's a lot of civil war history near where I grew up. Um, but these developments that often have stores, like these big box stores, these big national chains, they just really cover up any sense of history. So there's also this aspect of the covered up sense of history um, that I've always been interested in. And there's, along with that, this sense of information being obscured. So I mentioned there's a lot of data centers there. Um, this little caption on this image says, an aerial view of just some of the many data centers that call Ashburn, Virginia home. As the Loudoun Times mirror notes, Loudoun has been known as the king of data centers for some time now. And so whenever I go back home, I'm always thinking about this land, this landscape and the way that these data centers sort of look like these fortresses. And then in combination with this sort of village square, that's this weird pseudo-European covering up of some actual colonial history. And even the name Lao Down, I think sounds pretty I'm not sure from where, but it sounds pretty UK-ish. Sounds pretty British for me, that Loudoun. And so that's just like really fascinating to me is just, we're so close to the things that happened 300 years ago. And then the way our world looks is so far. And I think to counteract some of this generic bland stuff, um, my parents 
always take me to like historical sites and these sort of reenact reenactment places. Virginia is filled with like reenactment spaces, um, like Colonial Williamsburg and going to Gettysburg. And we would go to the Frederick Douglass. I don't know how many times we went to Frederick Douglass's house, but we went often. Um, so this sense of dislocation from history is a big part of my work. And one time I met somebody in California who was also from Northern Virginia. And I remember they said, yeah, it's so weird there. It's like minority report. And I hadn't seen minority report for years, but there was something about that that just made so much sense. Um, tech, data, surveillance, Washington, I don't know, Tom Cruise being weird, like Tom Cruise energy. <laughs> Just however, whatever that means. Uh, yeah, Tom Cruise energy, Top Gun. Um, so this is a question for you, personal quiz. What movie best represents the political attitude of where you grew up and how does that attitude show up in your work? And I have a couple more questions that didn't make it onto the slides here, but I got some questions. So these are the general themes of my work freedom, information being obscured, information capital, surveillance, the TV screen as a gateway to reality, finding identity in the middle of nowhere or construing identity, uh, grappling with identity, um, racially, genderly, sexually, um, bodily identity, allegory, um, biblical and European story structures, fairy and folk tales. Like in the same way that there's McMansions, maybe we could think of like mixed stories that I'm kind of interested in and like the the shell form that uh, we know of, of those stories. Um, town and country as being the same as figure and ground, nature's intelligence, comedy and tragedy of the banal and the existential plane slash poetry. And my art practice is something that I think of as a spiritual journey of evolving my consciousness in the body of a free black woman. So I work in a lot of different ways because I want to try to have fun with all of this and I wanna show it, I wanna call attention to it. And I want to enjoy the freedom of being able to make art. And I want to also reach people. I want to make things that are meaningful to other people that connect with people and um, that give people a way to deal, you know, with, our world because it's a lot to deal with. So I, I'm an optimist and my work is optimistic. So I'm just going to talk about three projects and the time is flying. So I guess I'll talk about these a little bit more quickly. Uh, and each of these three projects, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. So this project, Animal Static, I did at the kitchen in 2019. And it was an installation of four large scale color pencil on paper drawings and three channels of video. The video was all activated by motion sensor. So these little black things right here are the motion sensors. And they would also control the lighting on the drawings. So I was interested in this idea of reaching the, the limits of video. And so funny that just a year later, the pandemic happened. And then we went like through the screen with Zoom, like how we're on it now. And now we're so used to Zoom that we, we can't even like feel the sensation of how weird Zoom was anymore. And then, you know, probably in five years, we'll all be thinking and talking about that. But I wanted to think about that in terms of narrative. And what if the closer you got to the screen, the more mediated and busy the story got but then you wouldn't be able to see the whole thing because it's just it's like so big and you're so close and that and that's you know what 
I often feel like, or at least felt like back then, it's hard to remember what it felt like pre-pandemic and pre-binge watching every single show on TV and just being like glued to the screen in so many ways. And as an artifact of that interest in using these motion sensors as a way to make video watching participatory in some way, what was really interesting that ended up happening is that you couldn't look at everything in the show at the same time unless more than one person was there because you could only activate so many different motion sensors at once. And so that's always great when you set out to do one thing and then it also ends up doing another thing, which often happens when you're using technology because there's always the glitches that happen too. And that adds something. And then the drawings are color pencil on paper and their text drawings. They're more stoic than the videos. The videos are all humorous, they're all on my website. And they're about, they kind of revolve around this fictional beverage uh, company, novel, a novelty company called Ice and Cream that sells ice and cream, but not ice cream. And this is my friend, Marcel Alcala, who's playing Craig, who's the CEO of Evian, spelled A-E-V-Y-I-A-N. Um, that video in particular is really funny. I usually show that video, but that's on my website. Um, so to talk about the logistics. So how did this very like sleek, I, inside the iPhone looking space come to be? was quite a journey. The year before I was asked to do the show by Lumi Tan, who um, curated me into the show The Kitchen, I had been hunting for a studio in New York. I had worked in, I think, nine different spaces over the course of 11 months and wasn't really making a lot of work. I was spending so much energy just literally moving my things from one place to another, one place to another, setting things up in impromptu ways that I could, you know, like working in video, which is one of the advantages of being a multimedia artist is that you can work in different ways at different times, depending on what access to resources you have. So I was able to shoot this video lip gloss alert on this very, very simple green screen set with just myself and then make all the backgrounds and all the images in Photoshop. And then that video was screened on the High Line, which was amazing um, and exciting. But the process of making it for me was stressful because I really enjoy having a space that I can return to and that I can um, feel really solid in. So these are some of the spaces I worked in. This studio up here had no heat. When I say it had no heat, I mean, it had no heat. Like one of my studio mates left a BLT on a counter, on the counter for like a week because it was literally frozen. Like there was no heat. Uh, these are the candle, these are candles in the corner that I like tried to like heat, keep myself warm with because the space heater wouldn't heat it. So I built this like weird thing with like a clay pot. It was just, it was not good. I didn't stay there very long. Uh, right after that, I did this short residency at the Macedonia Institute, which is, um, it's like a, it's a small, it's a small, it's like a more like a restorative re retreat kind of like just a space to work. Um, and upstate in New York. So I was like working in their studio, but it's really like a garage space. And then they had a basement space again, unheated. And then I, this was the studio that I had, I think after I uh, got invited to do the show. But anyways, for this whole year, I was just so burnt out and like, like really not feeling well. And I was like, okay, I'm not even going to make I'm not going to try to make anything physical. I'm just going to write for a year. Then I was invited to the show. Very exciting, huge opportunity. But I, it was horrifying. Like it was terrifying. <laughs> I was so terrified. It was like going from 
I have no sense of stability and no sense of grounding to here's a big opportunity. And it feels like you can't fail because the kitchen has this amazing history and this amazing location. And one of my friends just recently asked me, like, was that, did you feel pressure? Did you feel stress? I was like, yes. Like I literally wanted to crawl out of my skin for four straight months. Like every day I woke up and was like, ah, like this is excruciating. Um, so what had happened was, oh, I have a little misplaced photo there. But what happened was I had these panels made. I had been making these drawings that were small. So I was like, okay, I'll just blow up the drawing because I, I can do that. And they didn't fit in the elevator. Um, because I didn't think to measure the elevator because I had never done something like this before. And I share this because these are the moments that happen. But I think we tend to think when we see people's installations, like, oh, they just, that was just, you know, I don't know, they just made it happen. And, and like, people must always know what they're doing. And it's like, you just figure it out as it's going, um, which is like anything in life. But I feel like there's certain moments that you hit where you really hit like steep learning curves. And this was one of them for me. So I found this other space to work and for like a month. And there is a picture of my friends, oh, there they are here, who were in my videos and provided a lot of comfort and love and and the great part of this show was collaborating with my friends which took away that anxiety um and a lot of that anxiety is just the anxiety to be you know perform to show up to to um to participate in the art world and in a big way and to like not fail and and that's something that you know, has been this thing to grapple with in, in the last six years is how much of my energy and my practice do I devote to the things that are immediate that I really value, like working with my friendships, collaborating, the process in the moment, and how much of my ent mental energy am I going to spend, you know, trying to manage aspirations and ambitions and, um, wanting to be included or worried about being validated. And these are all things that I think we wrestle with as artists because the path is so challenging um, and it's not straightforward and it's different for everybody. So this is just more behind the scenes. We had three projectors and we had to put the motion sensors in the walls. Um, so that's Lumi right there and Zach, who was a technical programmer and a few other people who are on kitchen staff and some who are hired just, you know, on temp basis to help with installations. So it went from this little sketchy idea to being a real thing. And this was a big moment for me too, just having the resources and having the opportunity to work with an institution where there is a team of people who are installing things, it was exciting, but it was also, you know, really um, very humbling and also like a, a situation I had never encountered or thought about because, you know, up until this point, I'm just working, working, working by myself, like all by myself. And now suddenly people are, they're doing things for you that they're paid to do, you know, la labor is involved, like labor is involved and, um, and the relationships that you have with people who are stewards to your work or who are working on behalf of your work is super important. And um, it's a huge part of the process is, and it's a different from collaboration, like whether it's working with a staff or an administrative team or outsourcing work is different from collaboration. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it was a great opportunity. 
And it also at the time was like very uncomfortable to me because I was like, wow, I'm not actually like, I'm in this role. I'm not comfortable in it, but, and it's exciting. But I just say that to say like, even in these moments of like great things coming together, there can still simultaneously be feelings of like huge insecurity or, um, I don't know, just like unsureness that nobody really, you know, prepares you for. Uh, here's just some more install shots and hanging the work. And this is the performance that I did with Molly Joyce, who also arranged the music for Focaccia Town Reloaded and Liz Fair. So we repurposed the space of the gallery that had these drawings installed in it and these videos installed with different video tracks and excuse me and different lighting in order to um, make this performance happen in the space okay so i'll go try to go through this one quickly so with defense mechanisms i want to talk a little bit about strategy of working in a multimedia way. I've mentioned some of it. Um, I was invited to do a show at Buffalo Institute for Contemporary Art pre-pandemic, and they had a much smaller space. And then after the pandemic, they moved into this really big warehouse space. So there was something that happened with this show that was like already about, oh, like expanding and, um, and like figuring, figuring that out. Um, as somebody who thinks about space a lot or thinks about space primarily and how people are going to encounter this space, space can also be a, a, a challenge. Um, there's, I definitely have the impulse to fill. Some people don't have that at all, but I think about the whole space as a, as a palette or as a canvas. So this was a show of prints, sound sculptures, and drawings. And the sculptures are uh, trunks of walnut tree. And then you can press the numbers and you hear different audio tracks from different projects I've done in the past. So this show opened in 2021. So this is a post-pandemic show. And the way I really got into this work was wanting to revisit one of the themes from one of my first videos, which is called Red, Yellow, Blue, Untitled. And I wanted to make a bunch of work that was red, yellow, and blue. And this is a print of a drawing that had been in a show a year prior. And then this series of prints is called Morning. There's, all the prints are screen prints. And then I also screened this film video called Communication. Um, and these are some of my friends who are up there who also very graciously helped with the install. And in addition to Nando and Emily who run the space. And this is Evan and Lindsay and we went to Niagara Falls. So it wasn't all grueling work, but I don't know, like these moments are important because they're real. Like it really takes a lot of help and a lot of work. And, and then there's also really great moments that I love about being an artist, like traveling and meeting new people and having fun in the place that I'm visiting. So the show was installed in Buffalo and then Delhi Gallery, which is a gallery that represents me, we decided that it'd be great to also put up the show so people in New York City could see it. So this was the installation at Delhi Gallery. And it's all the same works just laid out differently. And this piece doesn't have that same platform underneath it. This says healing, peeling, peeling, feeling. 
this video is a, a series of characters who are having different reactions to a, the, a house being lowered down. It's, not, it's filmed on a stage, a house being lowered down and then going up and then like an apartment building complex being lowered down and coming back up and uh, trees being lowered and coming, going back up. And it sort of relates to the theme of that big long video communication. These are security cameras that play a uh, poem and drawings. So with this body of work, part of the, the strategy was red, yellow, and blue primary, simplify some of the language. I feel love, which is a song that I love, Donna Summer, that got me through the pandemic. Um, this print, Untitled Sunset, simplify or make fundamental some of the language and some of the color choices in order to explore different ways of producing work. So that's what I was talking about before, the sort of like economy of, of figuring out how to work. So taking a poem that I had written before because I don't know I have some weird thing in my brain that's like you have to make everything new all the time so taking something that I had written before that I hadn't shown and putting it in this camera and making this a piece that like oh this small piece like that easily could be installed somewhere else like I might get an opportunity to show my work somewhere else in that way um and also with the video which in this installation was shown on this small tv with that video that was installed later at Western Front uh, this past year, 2022, just as a video. But in this installation, I wanted it to be more of an object. And so with working in all these different media, it also gives me an opportunity to try different processes. So this is some of the print making process with Pegasus prints in Brooklyn. So this is the screen for that yellow print, which is called Pop, Pop, Pop. And I'm in Philly, which I didn't mention, but I'm in Philly. So we were going back and forth and like sending like a lot of iPhone notes. Like most of this print making process happened over the phone, which was super challenging because it's like, I'd be like, can you take a picture of like a yellow pencil next to the thing? So I know like what your iPhone is doing to the colors. And so it was really like, like really nitty gritty kind of um, nuts and bolts, like color work. And then we did this other print with Do Good Press with Leslie Do Good, who's really amazing and just opened up a new location in Brooklyn. But at the time her printing press was in her apartment room basically. So she had kind of like curtained off a section of her apartment. And so we did this one on the left. And, but also working with Leslie, it was like a process of, uh, oops, a process of working over the phone. This print is called Beyond Red. And so, so, so interesting to me, this work. I knew there was something I was like, there's some gotta be something that's just red. I just want to make a red thing. Right. So the idea itself is like one second red, like it's not, it's barely an idea. It's a color, you know, um, obviously there's a lot of historical associations and references and lots of conversation that you could have and talk about abstraction and even talk about abstraction and the FBI and how communi communication that video is about a um, media company called Omnesia. There's there's like tons of places you could go because you can always go tons of places with color field work. But um, having the idea and the impulse was super quick, but then actually making it. So the cost of making it, the um, the just the physical gesture. I didn't make the print, but um, Pegasus prints did. And so for them, they had to figure out like how, 
like how do we actually do this because I think it's one of the bigger prints that they've made how do we like sweep on this paper what paper do they do we print on um and it was just so interesting because to go through this process of making this big thing that's like at the same time uh, I was also feeling like pretty anxious about it like is it enough it's literally just red and then it was so cool to find out like people really responded and connected to it so this was like a really liberatory moment for me like pr pretty much as liberatory as it gets is like made a big color thing and it was like people were like yeah this is awesome it's red we love it and I'm like great I love it too so I think one of the reasons why I've also included some of these moments of like fear or hesitation or insecurities because like those fears also drive me forward in my practice like I also am always working in these different ways because I am energized by doing things I don't know how to do and I like to do that and that is also part of what contributes to this like all working in all these different ways and expanding and expanding is because I just I love to do new things. This is just some of the behind the scenes with the sculptures I worked with Thaddeus Echevria and Aaron Bilheimer to make these. And this is my studio at the time, just doing something totally illogical and drawing on these really big panels with like tiny color pencils, which in itself, in the process of making these felt very performative. And some of these photos I'm sure you all have seen, but just for the video communication, activating my multiple personalities I've always done a lot of things with characters like even growing up um, with my mom we'd always talk in a lot of like character voices together and one of my mom's favorite shows and I would watch it with her as a kid is uh, Tracy Takes On with a comedian Tracy Ullman so I always loved like different characters Okay, so this brings me to my last little section, which is about Carnelian, which is the show that I'm working on right now. So sort of as like a pretext to this show, I shot a film in 2020 that I have gone on a very big journey with, and it's finally premiering it at Eflux in New York, if anybody will be in New York around Valentine's Day, on Valentine's Day. And so this I shot right before the pandemic and the pandemic is one of the reasons why it's taken so long to edit it because there's just a lot to process in the editing of this. And it's a sci-fi story. It's about this woman named Coretta whose company called the Catalog of Human Emotions or company slash project, it gets acquired by Omnesia, which is the omnipotent media force in the world of my work. Um, so they acquire this catalog and, and then she gets kind of lost in this in-between space and these two sort of like body double clone fake account versions of her have to go back and save her. Um, so this is a project that's taken me a really, really long time to get through and edit it. And this is the first time I worked with like, a, I wrote a script, like a script script and cast people who were actors and not uh the people I've worked with before friends and collaborators are a lot of them are performers but not necessarily like actors as their profession so this is the first time I was working with actors working with people from uh I used to go to clown gym in New York I have a background in clowning theatrical clown so some clown folks and um trying to make like a proper film and not just a video. And that project has taken a long time to come together. And I kind of had to edit communication, which is just starring me to get to the, the mental place where I can get through this project, the glass eye. Oh, I didn't organize these photos. Anyway, so here's a bunch of uh, 
photos of, I can even just straighten them out here. Wait, how do I do this? Okay, <laughs> behind this is a photo of me with some mud on me in Vermont. I did this residency this summer that was really great and got a chance to like clear my head and get into the headspace of getting ready to do this big collaborative project. So this is the cast and crew of this project. Um, and it's super exciting. It's the first time that I'm just like reaching out to so many different people, collaborating with so many different people. I'm working with my friends, Audra and Paula V who are working on the costumes and the set respectively. And I am also collaborating with a composer named Samuel Beeb, and I'll play some of that music in a second. And just to show you a little bit of like how this project is going. So this was the first installation mock-up I made this summer, just like with craft store stuff and just kind of mapping out where things might be. And that design has evolved and changed. Um, but some of the things I'm sort of interested in creating in this space for this show is these porticos and some of the things I was talking about earlier about allegory or fable. These are, this is Maxfield Parish painting and this is at the Philly Museum of Art. Um, they have an insane third floor if you're ever in Philly. Definitely check it out. It's really crazy. They have like these, like just full on, like temples, which is like messed up that they have those. But I don't know, you know, as individuals, we cannot control museum acquisitions and plundering and looting. So if it's at the museum, you might as well go see it. Um, but yeah, the third floor of the Philly Museum is insane. And these are sort of things I've been working with before. Um, like White Castle. So that's perfect, you know? And so this is the design that we're working with now. It's, so there's three characters in this story and they're sort of these archetypal characters that represent um, like earth, fire, air kind of. Um, Arachrosops, Nasiria, and Bicyclus are their names. They're, the names are actually different species of moths. I wanted to pick names that sounded like they could either be gods or muses in this sort of Greco-Roman style, but actually the reference point for their names is something completely different. And then there'll also be paintings in the space. And the, the, the storyline is they're basically dealing with the coming of the unknown, which is represented as a boom. So this is just some past music that I worked on with Molly Joyce. And eventually we'll have music like this for Carnelian, and this is my last little bit. So really quickly, I just wanted to share the progression of how we worked on this. So there's eight tracks in the production and one of them is called Ace of Wands. And this one started in my journal at night one night I was thinking about how I really you know for this project I really want to make songs but I haven't performed songs or like really written a, a body of musical work in a while so I was just thinking okay just pick a tarot card and just write anything like just just write a song before you go to bed like in your journal it doesn't have to be good like just write you know five lines of a song um, and that's often the kind of prompt I sort of give myself is just try it and make it bad and then go from there. So this is the first version I sent Sam and I hope the sound comes through. Once there was a man with a castle in his hand and anything he wanted he could have. Once there was a man with a castle in his hand and anything he wanted he could have. And what he called it, he called a melody. Once 
once there was a man with a castle in his hand and anything he wanted he could have. So I sort of have some lyrics, some theme, but not all the words. And then, uh, so I sent, um, there's a little version in between this where then I wrote more of the lyrics and then sent it to Sam. And Sam made this. Once there was a man with a castle in his hand, and many things he wanted to have. And what he called it. So that's Sam kind of figuring out like what's what's the sound and we're going back and forth and like talking about um like our pl playlist of like reference tracks and you know like oh i really love this simon and garfunkel song america and also love like wise blood and all these different artists and um mini ripperton and not so much influence on this song but ton tons of musical influences that we're going back and forth about so then he took, then I sent it for him with the lyrics, and then he sent me this one back. And then the last version is then, this isn't really even the last version. And then I record a version. And after recording this version, then what we're in the process of now is sending it to the actors who are going to be playing these roles. So this is all like real time. Like this is where we are like right today, like right now. So the, this song is about the digital world and becoming lost in it. And overall, in the whole production of Carnelian, there's references to technology, but they're portrayed in more symbolic ways. So they talk about the phone as being a portal. The computer is a wooden box that's, and sand falls through it. And I was interested in using this imagery because, you know, now we're just at this point where there is just some like completely senseless thing happening like every other second. And it's like how, you know, how do you, you can't even like process it in real time. So it felt like a good time to return to um, archetypes and symbolic language. And that is where I will stop. And I'd love to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you.
the end. <laughs> Um, I have a question. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I resonated with so much of that, like where I am right now, fits in with a lot of that, which is just cool. So thank you. Um, I also am wondering how you deal with, like, since you work in so many different mediums and like to learn new things all the time, how do you manage like the pressure of like, not being an expert in everything and like the voices in the back of your head maybe you don't have them of like being like oh pressuring you to fit into some sort of directed area yeah i it's a great question i i well i would be hesitant to say i don't have them in my head at all but i think there is a kind of freedom I feel like in doing something new that like I don't have to be good at it because I can always say well that's my first time doing it so I think that's why I'm always trying to do something new is because it, it it relieves me of the pressure of feeling like I have to be an expert or something or like I should be better at this by now um and I think hmm yeah but I don't think that you know it's not like that all the time because there's lots of things that I do that I I guess I feel that pressure with the things that I do a lot like the things that remain constant and familiar so same pressure different source and I think now more and more as I'm showing my work more and sort of understanding more about the ecosystem of art and also under becoming less a little bit less precious about art um not in a way that dampens the quality of my work or like what I'm trying to do but in the sense of understanding like there's just certain processes that happen in art that will happen in any other field or there's just certain aspects of like working in a marketplace um, lowercase m that like having a more of an understanding of that helps take off the pressure like the a big shift that happened for me a few years ago was sort of under being able to separate this like pyramid image that I used to have of like you know there's the things whatever things those are like people companies universities brands and like literally anything like there's these things at the top and and only those things at the top are the ones that are known about and like everything else that's below that like doesn't matter or doesn't exist or like there's nothing good to be found there and the sort of had this like radical mental shift that has really just happened from like I don't know just like probably just getting a little bit older and living more and understanding like oh no there's you know like I'm trying to think how to explain it. it's like you know you just walk around your city or wherever you are and you're like wow there's so many businesses and I guess they're all in business so I guess that people are patronizing all of these businesses and sure some people are having a lot of money problems but like somehow there's like a lot of stuff like people are just doing a lot of things and like, you know, who knows how we meet the people we meet in our life, but somehow we do. And like, what's the thing that separates like you having a friendship with somebody versus that other person down the street being a stranger and you never talk to them in your life. Like, I don't know, but like somehow you have the people that you know, and like you have networks and those people have networks. So it's sort of like this different understanding of like, oh, it's all more like a fishbowl. It's not really like a pyramid. And that somehow relieves the pressure when I realize, like, yeah, I don't, for me, the pressure I really feel it with is like the pressure that I put on myself of like recognition or like notoriety and like, and it's insatiable, you know, cause it's like, I know I've like had lots of wonderful things happen with like press, but it's kind of like, <laughs> 
I need more, you know? And then, cause that's how like culture and media feeds us is, is like, it feeds on that need to be seen. I feel like that's also part of this like culture of visuality and like social media and stuff. But yeah, just having this different understanding. Um, and then the other part of that is like, in the last few years, like realizing like it's more fun and enjoyable and makes better work if I just work with other people who I think are kind of better at what I'm trying to do than I am. Like, I really don't have to do everything. And that was going to be one of my questions is like, for everybody is like, what's a bottleneck in your process? And how could that bottleneck be alleviated by either working with other people collaboratively or outsourcing or like simplifying or just kind of like, yeah, like taking your ego out of it, asking for help. So that's probably the main way that I deal with depression now is like, oh, I don't have to be good at everything. There's so many other people who are good at it. And isn't that great? And like, and that's, yeah, that's been a really, really fun, awesome part of like what I'm working on now because it's like, whoa, like we're really like making something and like very soon we're going to come to the part in this process where it's, it's not out of my hands, but it's completely different than whatever I saw in my head, just because there's so many people working on it. And that's really exciting. So yeah, I think asking for help and just like, oh, this was another question too I had was what's the texture of your practice and what are, and who do you know who has an interesting texture in their practice that could complement the texture of yours? We have time for about one more question. So does anyone have a question? Yeah, I'm good to say for a couple too. I know I was talking for um, more than- Hi Lex, years. I have a question. First of all, I just want to say what an incredible presentation. It was really helpful. Um, I was just wondering as an artist, why you created an LLC? Yeah. So um, that's something that I first learned from my first employers when I was living in LA and I was a studio assistant and also studio manager for a studio assistant for Brian Brass. And I was a studio manager for Petra Courtright and Mark Horowitz. And so the benefit of that was I got to see how they were doing things. And um, at that point, Petra had a very, and still does, has a very um, active career in the market. So I was doing all of this stuff, you know, all of this money stuff. And um, it's also something that I have been told by many artists, like, having an LLC, have all of your business go through your LLC, just because an LLC protects you um, in the case of things going awry, in case people become litigious, um, in case you get sued, I don't know, in case you're working on a project and somebody gets injured and nothing that has, I think, really come up in that sense. It's also good to have an LLC though, because you can get, um, oh, I forget what it is, but there's like a thing that you can get that exempts you from tax. I've yet to activate this part of working with an LLC, but it's like, if you, certain businesses, when you buy from them as an LLC, if you have this number, it's like a reseller, some, something like reselling. I'm just scratching in the surface here, but it's something about reselling and then you don't have to pay like state tax or sales tax. Um, it's another reason to have an LLC. Um, I feel like people also just take you more seriously when you have an LLC and you give them the EIN. It also keeps you from having to give your social security number out everywhere because you use an EIN instead of social security number. Um, if anybody else has other you know, reasons, feel free to jump in. Those are the ones that I can think of now. Um, I've just been doing, I've had my LLC for six years. 
depending on your state, you know, they have different costs. Uh, I'm registered in Virginia. So you don't have to be registered in the state that you're operating in. So my LLC is in Virginia, still using my family's address. And in Virginia, it's like 50 bucks a year um, to keep your LLC. I have had, I won't go into too many details, but I have had a litigious moment in my life, which is not something I really ever thought I would have. It didn't thankfully get into any money, um, but it was like a copyright issue. And yeah, it was like shocking to think like, okay, I, I need to find a lawyer. I need to but like, who <laughs> that was like, well, which lawyer are like so many lawyers and like, is this going to work? Like, you know, um, but like these things do come up and they're like, not what you're thinking about when you're in your studio is like, you're not thinking about this kind of thing, but it is important. So yeah, if you, if you, the sooner I think that you can just set up an LLC, it's great. And you know, it's not like, um, it can just sit there inertly. Um, it's just something that you're doing business under. You don't have to like use it anyway, in any way other than like, I just get, so what I do is my, my payments go to my LLC. So like with this talk, the contract is going to go to my LLC and my, I have a business account that's separate from my personal bank accounts, but I have a business account and that account is attached to that LLC. And that has like a, so I have a business account with like a business card, business debit card and all of that stuff. It's also just, I, I like to keep it separate. It's helped me a lot to be like, this is my personal money for like my rent and my food and my whatever I want to do. And then this is my like studio money. I find it helpful to, to have them be separate. Um, and then, okay, I'm getting more and more reasons. And then like paying people too, like paying people out of your LLC and Oh, duh. The number one reason is for your like tax, tax deductions, because you're a self-employed worker. Like essentially you're an entrepreneur and that is just what it is, you know? And, you know, for whatever reason in art spaces, we kind of like bristle about having these conversations, but like we are entrepreneurs who, when we make sales, we deal in luxury goods, like no matter what your practice is, if somebody's buying it, it's a luxury good. And, um, and yeah, so you like declare things on with your LLC. So like, like I have, I'll probably do it for my taxes this year. I'm in my house right now, but I do work here. Like I am working right now so I can put a portion of my rent as a business expense. And then that will, like, if you have more expenses, then you have income, then you have to pay less tax. And I don't think as artists, we need, I mean, I think taxes are important, but the way, I won't get into it. You all know what I'm talking about. And you know what I'm saying? I think if everybody, if everybody is writing all kinds of things off, then like definitely artists should too. <laughs> So that's also why you should have an LLC is so you can say that everything you do is your business. Cause it is like business lunches are business costumes are business. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thinking of, um, since my mom is on this call, when I was a kid, there was this this character I used to do who was like a Texan governor and he would say, vote for me and I'll lower your taxes. Vote for me and I'll make this whole world expensive. Lex, if, if no one else have a question, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate that uh, presentation and I wish you 
were here when I, I'm sure others laughed as well, but we was just like on silent, you know, but it was uh, quite, you know, um, quite hilarious, like to when you give yourself the liberation, you know, to kind of like invent things like what you said, um, like um, Tom Cruise energy. Or like, you know? <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm going to use it now. That's totally makes sense. Uh, so like, it's really, I really appreciate the, all the things that you, like, you know, a very successful career that you have and really showing what's going on behind the scene. Uh, but also I could totally get your personality uh, in this presentation. And I really appreciate that, you know? So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you so much. This, this was really fun for me to make and put together and also like include those family photos. Cause I, I don't normally do that, but it's like, wow. Um, is there anything that's like not really part of your practice? And so much of the time we just see the work and it's like, that's great. But it's like, how did it get that way? <laughs> like literally like, I mean, cause when I look at art, I'm always thinking like, how did they make this? Like, how especially with sculptures like how is this fabricated like how is this possible so I'm happy that I could share a little bit of the like putting it all together 